All right, time for questions from y'all. Um, we got questions. Uh, if you've still got them, uh, please pass them to the end of the rows. And uh, um, let's, uh, let's, let's commence. Sorry, we thought we had 30 more seconds. Um, so a question. Um, what would happen to the BDS movement if they dropped the right of return? Do you think it would start to take on more of a legitimate footing? Well, I think the thing that the BDS movement has to do is acknowledge the right of the state of Israel to exist. You know, that, that's As the, a Jewish the, state. And, and the right of the Jewish people to a national home. Until the BDS movement acknowledges that, I think that they will be a marginal and fringe movement. I think they would have a lot more impact, actually, if they would acknowledge that and then say what we're protesting is the policies of the government and the policies particularly in the, in the West Bank and over the Green Well, then line. they'd be the same as you, basically. But we don't advocate boycotting I'm anything. saying then they would be the same as you. I mean, With the boycott be. tactic. Okay, fine. Right. right. So then they'd be okay. Now, by the way, I would, just, I would just point out, I mean, so I think if they were to do that, recognize Israel as a Jewish state, recognize the right of the Jewish people to return to their ancestral homeland, to live in peace aside, a Palestinian state, and to get rid of the idea that the refugees um, are all, are all, all have to return, then I, think, then I think there would be much more to talk about. I would still say, and I think Jeremy actually agrees with this, um, that boycotting is fundamentally a very bad idea. Boycotting never ends well. If you want to read, read about this, uh, Anthony Julius' masterful work about um, anti-Semitism in Britain has a really important point about how boycotts never end with boycotting products. The Nazis actually started by boycotting products, and if you look, boycotting is actually a suggestion that there is something anathema about the other, and aside from the fact that, as I said before, boycotting is just stupid because the first people who lose their jobs are actually Palestinians. And you can't boycott just the West Bank and not the rest of Israel because the companies are entirely, what, are you going to boycott South Dakota, but you're not going to boycott? I mean, it's just ridiculous. You, can't, you could not go to South Dakota, but the companies do business all across the country. You can't, it doesn't work that way. But, um, so aside from the fact that boycotting is just simply self-destructive for those people's viewpoints, boycotting, if you just study it in general, always ends by objectifying the other, and it never ends with the boycott of products. It always goes to a much darker place, and therefore Jews and non-Jews alike who disagree with Israel's policies should find lots of ways to make that clear. They should not engage in boycotting, which is to fundamentally try to undermine the very essence of the state of Israel. Okay, so the question over here is, can there be a two-state solution when Hamas and Fatah cannot agree? Should there be a three-state solution, Israel, West Bank, and Gaza? The Palestinian people don't view it as a three-state solution, so there never will be one because that's not what they want. They do want political reconciliation. It is not happening right now. Uh, what I would suggest that the diplomatic team is working on right now is an agreement that would be inclusive of Gaza, but the Gaza pieces would be essentially put on the shelf until the Palestinians reconcile politically. Hamas has to accept the state of Israel, recognize the state of Israel, it has to renounce violence, and it needs to accept the agreements that have been agreed to and that would be agreed to. And that's the only way it's going to be accepted into the political uh, world that Fatah is now in. And until that happens, they will be left aside. There will be sort of a shelf agreement. Yeah, I wrote a piece in the Jerusalem Post. You can find it online. It's riveting reading, so I heartily, heartily recommend that you do. Uh, it was called The Five-State Solution. Uh, I wrote it about, I don't know, three, four, five years ago, and I advocated one state for the Haredim because, really. Um, and um, so there was, there was a Jewish state, there was a Haredi state, there was a West Bank state, there was a Hamas state, which I called Hamasan, and um, there was another state, I forget who I also wanted out of my life. But... Um, but, uh, but in any event, I basically, I think that Jeremy is right. There's not going to be, an, Hamas, Hamas is about as likely to give up violence and to recognize the Jewish state as, uh, I don't know, Charles Manson is to start working for Greenpeace. But um, it's not very likely, and therefore I think that's actually a huge, it's a huge problem because Israel's going to make a deal with major territorial concessions and still be fighting a terrorist organization predicated or dedicated to its demise. It makes it very, very complicated. I don't know if the shelf thing works or not. Uh, but that is an undoubtedly very, very complicated issue. And I would just want, again, as much as we commonly don't know about Israeli politics and Israeli geography, whatever, I also think it's very important for us to know a lot about Palestinian politics and Palestinian demography. And we should all understand here that one of the reasons that Fatah 
i.e. Abbas's party, is still in charge in the West Bank is because he gets an enormous amount of support from Israel. Part of the reason that Hamas has not taken over the West Bank is because Israel is able to bolster Fatah in the West Bank. It's by no means out of the question that Hamas could take over the West Bank. It happened in Gaza. By virtue of what is anyone here, especially if it's a democracy, by virtue of what is anyone here certain that just as the Muslim Brotherhood took over Egypt, just as the people fighting Assad are actually fundamentalist Muslims in a lot of ways. Just as the people who are likely to overthrow King Abdullah in Jordan are much more radical Muslims than he who was a very moderate kind of secular Muslim, why do we assume that we're going to make a deal with Fatah, Abbas's party, and that there's no possibility that in three years through general elections that Hamas will be elected. But the one thing I would say, though, is that the odds of the stock of Hamas going up are greater if there's no agreement. I think that Actually, the, Hamas's stock is much lower today than it was five years ago. Much lower today. Absolutely, because they're actually having to run something until people don't like them when they're actually There's running. a lot of reasons for this so, being lowered. But, Hard, but, but I think that in the war between moderates and extremists that is all through the Middle East, the single most important thing we can do to boost the stock of the moderates is to reach an agreement with them. If you don't reach an agreement, if, if, if Fatah and the moderates can't deliver freedom and independence, then the extremists will have a better case and their stock will go up. The most that you can do to boost the stock of the moderates is to make the everyday economic and civic lives of Palestinians much better, which we should and must do even if we can't reach an agreement. How would you respond to the statement that Israel causes anti-Semitism? <laughs> there's smoke rising over no, here. No, there's no <laughs> smoke rising. It's like, you know, prove, prove to me that the tooth fairy isn't real. I mean, um, I don't know where to start. Israel doesn't cause anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is a very strange illness. I mean this very seriously. First of all, it's an, it's, it's an illness. It's like a virus which mutates. It takes different forms in different parts of history. So there was a period in the Middle Ages when people, human beings all across Europe, thought mostly in theological categories, and therefore anti-Semitism was fundamentally theological anti-Semitism. The Jew was wrong and destined to burn in hell because they didn't accept the meaning of Jesus, etc., etc., etc. Then there was a period in the early 20th century, the late 19th century, when the whole science of race was... The, the, the sort of cutting edge of thinking among perfectly decent people, by the way, all across Europe. And anti-Semitism took on a racial quality, and we know where that went, to a very dark, horrifying place not that long afterwards. Then, after Israel was born, anti-Semitism morphed once again, and we see it, I think, in a whole array of ways, mostly directed through a new kind of a morph as a kind of an anti-Israel. Israel has no right to exist. It's about the same thing. It's about trying to destroy the Jewish people. If Israel were not to exist, anti-Semitism would simply find a different way of expressing itself. It has been theological, it has been national, it has been racial and scientific, and now it's directed at the Jewish nation state. What's also terrifying about the disease called anti-Semitism is that other people have the disease, but we're the ones who die from it. And it's a kind of a strange, very strange virus. Israel does a lot of really stupid things. America does a lot of really stupid things. I come from a country, I come from a country, where every single citizen, Jewish, Christian, Arab, with not a single exception, has complete health care. Get a heart transplant for free. Israelis look at this country and they don't get it. What do you mean a country as rich as America, after Obamacare, whatever you think of it, let's not go there tonight, still has tens of millions of people who can't get prenatal vitamins, who can't get a throat culture, who can't get treatment. I mean, they just don't understand it. And you know what? If you separate the politics from it and the medical profession and how complicated it is, just zoom way, way out. It's lunacy. It's just lunacy. Doesn't make America a bad place. It doesn't make America a bad place. 
Israel does lots of crazy things. But to say that because America doesn't have health care for everybody, America's evil and ought to be destroyed, be destroyed is crazy. Similarly, to say that because Israel doesn't do what you would like Israel to do with the Palestinians, when Jeremy already acknowledged that there are dozens of countries with infinitely worse things going on that nobody seems to care at all about. Um, Anti-Semitism is caused not by Israel. Anti-Semitism is caused by a sickness. Israel's the most recent excuse. But I will say, I just want to add two things. One, I, I think there is a tendency when Israel gets criticized for some of its actions and some of its policies for some of its defenders to immediately throw around the anti-Semitism charge. Correct, but you're not saying that I do that. No, no, no. Okay. I'm saying that that happens. You're right. And I think that's really, really problematic. I agree with you about because that. Because there is real anti-Semitism, and it devalues the notion of anti-Semitism when you take criticism of Israeli policy and you call it anti-Semitism. Correct. So that's one thing. The other thing that I, we probably don't agree on uh, is that I do think that the policies of this government and of occupation and of what's happening to Palestinians is adding fuel to the fire. So I think that while the underlying fire is there, was there, will always be there, and I would agree with that, that the ongoing situation and the ever getting worse situation on that front is making that anti-Semitism worse. So I think it does add fuel onto the simmering fire that's there. And I don't know whether we'd agree on that. Uh, we might or may not. I, I, don't, I think neither of us know exactly what would be in that case. But here's what I do think. I think that there are plenty of people out there who right now are pushing Israel to go back to the 67 borders, who if Israel went back to the 67 borders, would then want to know, well, why is Carmiel in the middle of the Galilee, which was captured in the 47 to 49 war, but is beyond the borders that the United Nations voted on, it's what Israel captured during the War of Independence. Why do you get to keep that? In other words, there is only one set of borders that Israel's ever had that the international community has ever agreed to. Those are the fundamentally, utterly indefensible borders out of ever 29, 1947. And I think there are a lot of people out there, Jeremy, if you can get us to go back to 67, then they're going to want us to go back to 1947. Because at the end of the day with this, and you and I don't agree, and that's fine, but this is about people not accepting the idea that the Jewish people has joined the family of nations which like the French and the Spanish and the Italians and the Germans and the Poles, etc., etc., live in an ancestral homeland and have their own country. I think a lot of people, and I don't want, I'm not saying that this is true of you at all, obviously, but there are a lot of people out there who would rather beat their breast about how the Jews are being victimized than actually see the Jews have an opportunity to live their lives on their own. So this question that came in is for Dr. Gordas. It says, in your opening, you use the analogy of an oncology unit to make your point that not all problems have a solution. The question is, what happens to those patients in the oncology unit for whom there is no solution? They die. Aren't you afraid that without a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, Israel and or Palestinians will suffer the same fate? Yes, I'm very worried. I'm very worried. That's why I said earlier, as a kind of a throwaway line, but I'll make the point infinitely more clear now, I think that it's, Israel's what, 65 years old, give or take? 60, whatever, 65 years old. I think it's even money if Israel's gonna be around in 65 years. I think there's a possibility that Israel will be a thriving, democratic, economically robust, leading this, that, the other thing, Jewish revival, all the things that we all care about or most of us care about, most of us want, there's a very good chance that it'll be there in 65 years and it'll be simply all the more of what it is now in the best of possible ways. There's also a very real possibility that it just won't make it. That's a very real possibility. It doesn't mean that Syrian tanks are gonna come slicing through the Golan and cut through the Galilee. It might mean that one day Europe is gonna say we've had enough because you're not being accommodating enough to Palestinians and therefore our airlines are not flying to your country. And your airline is not flying to our countries. And if you go to the board as I did last night at Tel Aviv airport and you look at all the departing flights, there's a few to the United States and there's one or two to the Far East, China, blah, blah, blah. 
The vast majority of flights are to Europe. That's where Israelis go and do their commerce. All you need is the European Union to say to Israel, that's it, we're done. And the Israeli economy begins to falter. There's a possibility that a lot of things go wrong. The Haredim are an enormous internal problem. They use violence. The government, in my estimation, is not handling it right. But there are also, in this, no good solutions. No good solutions at all. And the more you get into the problem, the more you recognize how complicated it is. So the answer is yes, I'm very, very worried. And because, but I, but let me just finish. Let me just finish. You're speaking a lot. <laughs> they flew me from Israel. I mean, I just flew from Israel, too. <laughs> I won't interrupt you when you go. The fact that I'm worried means I want to be more careful, not less careful. And I am not going back to a border in which they are within a mile or two of the only runway of the only international airport we have until I know this conflict is fundamentally over. And until they say this conflict is fundamentally over, I ain't budging. And so far, not one of them has said that. Yeah, I, I just think that, that... Okay, that's enough. Okay, just kidding. <laughs> you know, I, I think the fact that, for instance, there is an Arab peace initiative. How many people have heard of the Arab peace initiative? A handful of hands. There is an offer from the Arab League that was endorsed by the Organization of Islamic States, 57 Muslim states, to end this conflict, to put it behind us, to accept Israel into the community of nations, if it will reach an agreement on the borders and, and pull back, if it will reach an agreement, agreed upon resolution of the refugees, etc. This is on offer. There is the possibility of a life-saving treatment for this cancer patient available. To sit back and say that the best we can do is figure out how to make the last days as comfortable as possible is not an approach to a living and vibrant and prosperous Israel and a, and a Jewish people. And that is why it is so important to do everything that we possibly can to take, to take advantage of this opportunity that we have with Secretary of State Kerry, who over the last nine months has brought about a revival of this conversation in Israel that wasn't there. A year ago, people were not giving any credence at all. They were all in Danny's camp. Today, I would say that you're in a minority as far as whether or not Harry has made a difference. That this starry-eyed optimist who has spent the last nine months going back and forth pushing both the Palestinians and the Israelis to make an effort to try to resolve this conflict, he has made an enormous difference. And so we at J Street are doing everything that we can to encourage Kerry and to support him and to say this is a pro-Israel Secretary of State. This is what it takes to save that patient in the oncology ward. And I don't accept that we have to sit back and watch the patient die and... and but I'm not saying that either. You know that I'm not saying that. That's not fair. So, so then push for a solution. Join us in pushing to achieve a solution. Tell, tell the Prime Minister that he should move forward. Tell Abbas he should move forward. Tell Secretary of State Kerry he's right in pushing tell forward. Tell Abbas to recognize this is a Jewish state. He has. And he, he has accepted the state visit. The fundamental, uh, by the way, the rebuttal. The what rebuttal did he say in the Times last week? The it rebuttal. Is completely out of the question. Did he say that, yes or no? Yes the or rebuttal, no? Did he say that? The rebu I answered that one already, which is that he said that, but that's not the answer to the problem. The answer to the problem is more than a catchphrase Jewish state. The answer to the problem is a paragraph that has mutual recognition of one country as the national homeland of the Jewish people, the other country is the national homeland of the Palestinian people with democratic and equal rights for all people. That's a full paragraph. And that he would say yes to. And in rebuttal, by the way, to the, the second point about the Palestinians not changing their narrative, factually not true. When the PLO was started in 1964, yes, they believed in violence, they believed in terrorism, they wanted to eliminate the state of Israel. In 1988, they changed their charter and they accepted the state of Israel. In 1993, the Palestinian National Council voted on that. The legislator of the Palestinian people voted on that and accepted it. When people didn't believe them in 1994, 5, and 6, that that can't possibly be, President Clinton flew over in 1997 to Gaza 
and presided over a meeting of the Palestinian National Legislature where they voted again on what they said in, 1998, in 1988 and 1993. So there has been a fundamental shift in the Palestinian narrative, too. And that gives me hope and that gives me optimism. All right, last question, I get it. Um, has there been a fundamental shift in your opinion of each other now that you've had these uh, <laughs> series of, of debates? And, and what do you agree on going forward? And why did you make that movie? <laughs> what is with you? Leave the movie, movie alone already. Really, it was moving. I always wanted to be a star in the film. I know, but uh, you haven't answered the question. Okay, I'm not Dang. going to. Um, well, I think we dress alike, blue suit, blue shirt, red tie. Um, you know, when nobody gave us, somebody sent us the dress code men menu. Here's what I think is really important about tonight. I think this is by far a much better conversation than the conversation that we had in San Diego. Uh, to my knowledge, aside from you and me, there's only one person in the crowd who was in the, it was in the other conversation also. I will let her go unnamed. But um, this is a much better conversation, and I appreciate the, the tone with which it was conducted. I appreciate the substance, and I appreciate the great job that you've done in moderating it. Uh, I think it's really been a model in a lot of ways of what Jewish discourse should be about. And I think that that should actually be replicated all over the country. I think, we, I think we agree about a lot. We obviously agree about the importance of the Jewish state. We're both committed to Israel remaining a democracy. We're both committed to Israel remaining a Jewish state. Uh, we would both agree, I think, uh, that the Palestinians should do a much better job of, of expressing their agreement that Israel be part of the region. And I would say that the Israelis need to do a much better job of making it clear that they really do actually want to move this thing forward. We disagree about some fundamental issues. We disagree about the extent to which Abbas is really a player or a partner, potentially. You're not going to convince me. I'm not going to convince you. And that's not the point of a dialogue like this. The point is not to convince each other. Uh, what, I, what, I, what, I learned, what I learned from, uh, I, I, I leave this particular evening feeling uh, very buoyed uh, with a U, because I, I think that um, it's, it's a wonderful thing to know that even in these relatively uh, extremized, it's not a word, but it is this, this era of extremes and people, the, the middle moderate losing out and all of us dealing only with the amount of information that can fit on the this, this screen of one small cell phone and so forth. Uh, we're finally able to show once again that people who disagree pretty strongly uh, can agree about a lot of things and can disagree respectfully. Uh, that's what I, I didn't learn, I knew we could do it, but I, I think it's, it's an extraordinarily important thing to model, not only to the people in this room who obviously wanted that, otherwise you wouldn't have come, uh, but it is being streamed, and I assume it's gonna go on the web, and I think it should, be, it should be a model of the kind of discourse that should take place not only about the Middle East. I think that uh, Orthodox Jews and Reform Jews and Jews and Christians and all other sorts of groups who disagree about things substantive and less substantive and stylistic and whatever, people actually can, when they know what they're talking about, have serious conversation. So it's not something that I necessarily learned. I knew we could do it, but I feel terrific that it was able to happen. And I'm grateful once again for the invitation to be part of something that I think is so important. You know, fu fundamentally, I agree with everything that, that Danny just said, which is, is something that I think the Jewish community as a whole uh, could learn from. I think that there is a real problem uh, in some of the established institutions of our community when uh, these kinds of conversations are not allowed, when speakers are disinvited from the right or from the left, uh, when we find an inability to try to work these things out through discussion and dialogue. So I take away from this evening a very positive feeling as well that four or 500 people show up to hear this conversation about uh, Israel. And I think that Danny's exactly right. If, if I speak alone or he speaks alone and people have just one opinion, you get a lot fewer people. And the engagement of a community and the turnout and the vibrancy of it, I think, is absolutely critical. So, you know, I, again, I don't think we've learned a lot about where each of us stands on these issues. I think the fundamental, you know, lack of belief in a solution versus belief in a solution or belief in a Palestinian partner versus not, those are pretty core beliefs that we're not going to uh, bridge the divides on and they'll define the debate going forward. Uh, but I think we did it in a way that I hope uh, was informative and hopefully a little bit inspirational uh, to people to get involved in one way or another in this. Don't leave this issue alone. Don't leave it behind. Get engaged. It is so important, not just for the state of Israel where Danny makes his home, but also for the state of the Jewish community here where all of us make our home. And I think it is vital to our community here uh, that the state of Israel be there as something where we share values and we share interests, and that will only happen if we're engaged. 
so i thank you and i thank danny and i thank all of the sponsors.